Everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Stay Attached podcast. This is actually our seventh one, and we have a very special guest here today, the one and only Doug Sensor Martin. He not only has 5 million followers across all social media platforms, probably probably 5 million plus, and uh, he also has four Call of Duty major wins and one national championship, and he's buff, so that's another good thing. But uh, Doug, welcome to the show. I'm excited to have you. I'm happy to be here, man. Let's get it started. Let's go. Uh, so first, but or first of all, we got to talk about Cold War. How are you enjoying Cold War? Like, what's the grind been like for you recently? The grind has been awesome. It's everything I wanted to have going into last year with Modern Warfare. Um, I think going into this year was great because going through all the trials and tribulations of last year and not being able to play the game and like struggling to find any ways of finding practice, I yeah. knew how to not make the same mistakes twice going into season two. And I just knew that going into this year, it was very important to be playing with a good team from day one. So I'm really happy that some really good players hit me up and they said they wanted to play with me. And we've just been really just on our grind every day. We had a little hiccup, which I'll talk about, I guess, a little bit later. But yeah. we had a team and we were all set up and we we're ready to go and everything looked good. And then basically one of our players sketched one of the players that was going to go to a pro team got sketched on and we picked him up. And now we're just kind of sitting here grinding every day. And it's been really good. Every single day we've been improving which is awesome. And then after that, I play some, you know, pubs and I get my guns ranked up. I'm trying to get this dark yeah. matter quick. And then I'm just going to be all in one competitive after I get dark matter. And it's just really awesome to be around the same type of people who have the same motivation that I have. And also at the same time, acquire the talent as well, because yeah. obviously you need to have both. You need the talent. You also need the drive. And I think the team that I'm playing with has both. So it's really nice and refreshing to be able to be a part of a system like that. Yeah, you definitely have a solid group of players and that have been very successful before and know what it takes to win and uh, be at that top level. So that's good to see. Honestly, the most important thing about new CODs is just putting as much time into the game and learning it as much as possible, staying on top of it, because things are changing so much with the metas and the guns and getting used to the maps. So it's definitely important to just be grinding from the start. But before we get too, too much in the Call of Duty, let's talk about a young Doug Sensor Martin when you were growing up. Uh, did you play many sports when you were growing up? Yeah, that was actually like I used to split my time between playing like Mario games and Zelda games and Pokemon games. And yeah. then I would play a lot of basketball. That was definitely okay. the sport for me. Always basketball until I got into middle school and I, I actually switched schools when I was in seventh grade. So when I was 13 years old, I went to this different school and I wanted to play football. I went to the gym class and I was like the fastest kid in the gym class. Mm -hmm. And I was just destroying the kids on the gym field. Like you should play football on our team. So I just like tried out for the football team and I made it and I just started playing football from there on out. And then I started getting back into Call of Duty again. So I was doing Call of Duty and football and I kind of gave up on basketball. So it was either like basketball, football or Call of Duty and then Call of Duty kind of just took over for me. Yeah. So how did uh, you find out about COD and really start falling in love with it and grinding it? Um, I was at my best friend's house when I was 12. And again, all I played was like third person games. I didn't like yeah. first person shooters. I thought they were whack. I remember I played this like uh, Metal Gear Salad or something like that when I was like, <laughs> yeah, old. I think and I remember I that. Yeah, I was like, well, like this game is just like depressing and sad. I don't want to play this thing. Like Mario is so much happier and I have much, yeah. a lot more fun doing this. So, and then when my friend had Call of Duty, I played it at his setup one time on his PlayStation 3 and I just became addicted like immediately. So I used to sleep over his house every night. We would play Search and Destroy until like four o'clock in the morning using a silence MP5 and rushing on every map in COD 4. Um, and then I got my own PlayStation because it was January when we started playing COD 4. By August, when it was my birthday, I got a PlayStation. So from August until early October, I went from like nothing to 10th prestige on COD 4. Yeah. And then when the new COD came out in November, I was number one in the world in the public leaderboards. And then I found out about game battles and you know the vibe from there. Everyone just goes yep. into game battles, plays search, work your way up in the variant ladder, and then you play in variant tournaments, and then you become a pro. So it's basically the same way everyone else came up too. Yeah, I know. Once you learn about game battles, that's where like – the passion like it just turns into a little fire and then it's just a raging inferno and you just the learn about curiosity everything. takes over you're like yeah. what's the ladder oh who's on the top of this ladder oh i can play on that ladder oh how do i play those guys oh exactly. they beat me i gotta beat them and then bam you're in the cycle yeah you want to get the high, the lowest gb rank you can you want to go start going to the event these events you see the live streams and stuff what was the first event you actually attended uh to compete at my first event was MLG Dallas and it was actually with the team that I won nationals with too. So like oh, okay. the first time I played with the team was the same team that I won with as well, but it took us the whole year. Like we stuck together and like we got eighth because our fourth virus, it was me, Vengeance, Virus okay. and Sinster on the first event and Virus ended up getting a virus going into <laughs> Sunday. So we played Fizzer, rest in peace Fizzer, but we played Fizzer on championship Sunday, man down. And we won the first map, Havana CTF three versus four. And it was like Fizzer, John and- Was that uh, the fear team at the time? 
No, it wasn't the fear team, but it was Fizzrup John and two others. And we beat oh, them 3v4 okay. in Havana. And then we just lost the next three. Mm-hmm. And then we went through trials and tribulations out that whole year. And we all came back together for the final event. And we won it. And it was it was great. And then Virus retired. Vengeance retired. And I kind of just went on my own way. Yeah, that's actually crazy. 3v4 to win a map. I that's like not even possible nowadays in any of the game modes. That's even that's even crazy back then. Like I know it was CTF, but that's still No, I mean, it was really hard back then yeah. too, but I don't know, man. We were just on another level. It was our first LAN, so we had to like prove to each other yeah. how good we were. And it was a lot of other people's first LANs too. That Black Ops one. I don't Dylan, how old were you for for the Black Ops one season? Do you know? Black Ops one, I think like twenty ten. Twenty ten. So I started I was probably like eleven or twelve. No, no, no. I think I was 12 or 13 because I actually spectated MLG Anaheim in Black Ops 1. I, that, I didn't play. I just spectated. And that was the first time I ever went to like a major LAN event and saw it. And it was like the coolest thing ever. Yeah, I was like 16 at the time, I think. And a lot of us, like I remember it was Aches. Aches just had his first LAN in MW2, I think. Big time in Rambo had a bunch of LANs. But like yeah. Scum's first LAN was MLG Dallas. Bobby's first LAN was MLG Dallas. I think TP's first LAN might have been MLG Dallas. So a lot of us like in general... Jcap's first land, I think, might have been that. It was either that or the MW2 Nationals, which was like a few months before yeah. that. So for a lot of us, like our first ever event was MLG Dallas in 2010, I believe. Yeah. So yeah, it was a long time ago, man. It flew by. So everyone was just like trying to prove themselves. You got to go there and be the best because you don't want to go. Everyone's playing online before. You don't want to go to that event and then get smoked. And then everyone just comes home and talks trash Dude. about you. It's crazy. Yeah, like, bro. Like the craziest thing was like, I, I'll never forget in that Black Ops 1 season, I played against Envy Blue for the first time. And it was Skump, Bobby, Fears, and Stainville. Okay. And they had that 74U rapid fire, right? Like this one, <laughs> rapid fire was allowed. Uh, yeah. These guys, Bobby was throwing grenades across the map, getting kills. Stainville was using the FAMAS, destroying. Skump with the 74U rapid fire. When I found out who the fuck that guy, excuse my language, but when I found out who that was, <laughs> I was like, I was like, this guy is incredible. Like, who is this guy? Skump. I didn't know who he, I was like, I got to watch this guy. Yeah. So I watched all his theaters and I'm like, dude, this guy is like the best player I've ever seen in my life. So I started watching so much theater and yeah. trying to get better. And I really put so much pressure on myself. So when I went into that first event, the game felt so much easier to me. I don't know how or why, but like for me online should have been really easy because I'm from New York and I was like a tri-state and a lot of people yeah. from the East Coast. But for some reason, that first event on land, I just really, really understood the game a lot better because it felt so much smoother and easier. And I was like, oh, like, like I'm not going to get joked. Nothing's going to happen. <laughs> I just got to do my thing and do yeah. my job for this team. And like, if I do my job... And if I really want to win, we're going to be able to do it. And that was just kind of like the the vibe that I always had throughout that year. So yeah. it was really nice to be able to see it all come true. That's actually funny you mentioned uh, the Tri-State area because that was like the spot back in Call of Duty. Like they had the NJ Halos. They had all those little locals over there that were happening. And I just felt like every Call of Duty player was pretty much from the East Coast and like that Tri-State area. All so of them did. I was all so jealous. Them. I was so jealous. Like I was watching like everyone tweet out about these small events or these local lands. And I was just like... All the way back in california shitty internet i'm like i wish i could go there and just try and prove myself or play like anything because it was it was tough back then but now it's i feel like everyone's starting to get towards like texas that kind of central area for like the main spot there's like an unofficial bubble in texas because so many players and teams are nearby so, that's the wave now for the yeah. pro league at least yeah, I, I always think about, I'm like, you want to be somewhere to make sure your career it can be prolonged and you can still be competing and doing well. Um, you want to be somewhere that's like central usually and just have insane internet. Of course, insane internet is the most important. Other stuff is just extra, but you got to have that like 1K, 1K, 1 ping uh, just to make sure you're giving yourself the best advantage because especially th- this season, everything is online. Like before everything was online, it was like, yeah, it's a cool online you play 2Ks. You go to a LAN event, you see what actually happens. Now we just play online. This is all that matters right now until hopefully we get LANs back. So yeah, if I was you, I'd be in Texas right now too, you know, got to. 100%. Got to. So stepping away from Call of Duty for a little bit, what made you want to start working out and getting jacked and then keep that up throughout your career and uh, your life? Well, I just remember being in high school and like my cycle in school was, I was an excellent student. I was always like very competitive. So I was always like top five in my class, super, super competitive. And I always wanted to be number one. And then once I got into COD, like my cycle started to become wake up for school at 5.30, be at school by 7.30 because the bus took forever. I was on a bus for like an hour and a half. It was ridiculous. Damn. But yeah, it was, it was horrible. It's <laughs> actually in the same commute. Every day of my life for four years, it was horrible, man. But going to school, finish school, go to football practice, get home from football practice around like five, 
play COD competitively with my team starting at like six and then play until like midnight, watch my VOD until like 2 a.m., then play pubs, right? So like I didn't go to bed until 2.30, 3 a.m. and I'd be waking up at 5.30. So every single day in school, I was sleeping in all of my classes. My grades went down to like low 80s like high seventies, low eighties. And it got worse every year in high school. And, um, yeah, it was just, it was just rough for me, man. And, um, I, I lost track. What, what did you say the question was again? Cause I just literally lost track of what you said. <laughs> no, you're good. I was just talking about how you get into like lifting and stuff. So, all right. Yeah. So in high school, I was really, <laughs> the wings are I was really, I was trying to do so many different things at the same time. I wanted to be this NFL superstar. And I also want to be this call of duty professional, but I didn't want people to know about Call of Duty because it was really embarrassing and like no one knew about it. Yeah. So I'm like, I'm like, I'm really good in this Call of Duty thing. I'm like near the top in it. And I know I'm really good at football. I'm one of the fastest kids and I'm really smart. So like I can make this thing work, but I can't do much with football because I keep on missing my games because I'm going to these tournaments. So I was kind of like in the middle of everything and I wasn't succeeding at one thing. So the one thing holding me back in football was the fact that I didn't have the size. I was really skinny. And I see all these other kids lifting in the weight room every day. And I just kept seeing them get bigger every day. And, and I see, see their arms getting bigger and their shoulders getting bigger. And I'm this skinny little twig. <laughs> yeah. And I'm eating like Sour Patch Watermelon at lunch every day. And I'm just like, damn, like I want to be bigger, but I don't want to put in the work because I love this Call of Duty stuff. Yeah. So when I was a senior and I won the national championship, I joined Leverage with Aches, TP, and Scump. And then there was nothing to play for that year. So we kind of like stopped playing. And then an event came up. And then I joined Envy with Dito, Proofy, and JCap. And we had like this LAN in the Envy house in North Carolina. It was like us versus Optic only. And we just straight up did like a pub LAN and like a competitive match versus each other. Yeah. And I met Skyler Stainville, yeah. for, the, Stainville for the second time because I met him a few months before that when I beat him at the national championship final. <laughs> and um, I was with Big Timer, Rambo, Stainville, Skyler, and Scum. And we all went to the gym because like Stainville and Skyler were like starting this workout grind and like trying to lose weight and trying to get jacked. I think Stainville was kind of jacked and Skyler was trying to lose weight for the first time. So they were really passionate about it. And I was with all of my idols in like one place. And I'm like, hey, like I won the national championship. I'm on the biggest Call of Duty team, like Optic and Envy were the two biggest teams. They were a lot closer back then. Optic really took it off now, but Optic yeah. and Envy were so close back then. And Envy was really cool. And I'm like, I made it to the top and I'm around all the people that I idolize and we're all working out together. And I always wanted to be better than them and everything. So when I was in a gym with them, I wanted to show them like, hey, like, I love working out too. So I want to get buff and I want to get big. And I like bench pressed a few times and I just really liked it. So when I went home, I took the money that I won from nationals and I just put it straight to a gym membership and I got like protein and pre-workout and yeah. a membership. And some of my friends from real life also were working out too. So I'd go with them every day. And then after like two months, they didn't want to work out anymore and I still wanted to go. So like I didn't have a car because they used to ride for me and my gym's like four miles away. So I didn't have a car and my mom couldn't drive me because she couldn't drive me because she was working. So I either had to walk to the gym or I had to take the bus. So I remember like trying to wait for the bus and it wouldn't show up. So I'd sit there for like two hours and it wouldn't show up. So I just started walking to the gym every day because I, I had no other choice. So like I just, if, they, if I couldn't get around my friends, I would just walk, which kind of sucked. But yeah. after like eight months of doing that every day, I got my own car and I started going to the gym and I wanted to get a job there. So I like got an interview and they liked me, so they gave me the job, and I started getting the gym membership for free, and I got a job, mm -hmm. and I was going to college, and I had a car. Money. Yeah, I got it. It was everything. great. Yeah, I, I started feeling myself, so I yeah. stopped playing college at that time, and I got into the gym and working out, and I just loved it, and it was awesome. Yeah, that's actually a perfect segue into my next question. So after you lived your dreams out for a little bit, you had your idols with you in that house, you found a new passion for working out, and then you said you got back into Call of Duty after. What made you get back into Call of Duty that time? And how did you later go on to join FaZe Clan and really blow up in the uh, Call of Duty community for like well, with social media like this time? Well, I won nationals in 2011. It was the yeah. biggest Call of Duty event of the time. And I was like, all right, this is it. Like, there's nothing bigger. And there was nothing announced. Like, the next year was MW3, yeah. which really sucked because in MW3, there was only, there was only tournaments in Europe. Yeah. And the only team that could go was Apex, which was like the Optic team. And they like left Optic to go to Apex. This is like before Scum joined Optic, I think, or like they joined Optic, but then Optic couldn't go. Yeah, so they all had to go to Apex. And the only other players from North America that went to these tournaments was like Aix, TP, Too Quick, and John or Fizzerp or something like that. Like yeah. nobody went to these tourneys other than European players. So there's nothing to play for for the whole year. And I had to graduate high school and, you know, I was in college. So I was like, all right, like I have to go to college. There's nothing going on in MW3. So I guess I just, I'm not going to play. Like I was at the top with all the best players. I was teaming with everyone who was the best in the world and there's nothing to play for. So I was like, all right, like I'm just going to go to college and do this thing. And when I went to college, 
I saw Nate Shot starting to blow up, and then Black Ops Two came out that year. And yeah. like before he even started blowing up, I wanted to play competitive going into Black Ops Two, so I started doing it. And then I saw Nate Shot blowing up, but during that season, halfway through, I couldn't compete at champs because I had Clay on my team, and I dropped him because we all thought Ooh, he sucked. That's we a, thought we we thought yeah. he sucked at the time. Yeah, he was pretty he, good he at Black Ops Two. He was that, he was pretty good at that game. We had fears on our team, so it was me, Saints, yeah. Fears, and Bobby. Or me saying Spears and Clayster, but Fears at the time was like the, the mod, AR. Yeah. Yeah. The mod was the guy. Like he was on leverage, winning every event with Aches and Scump and TP. Clayster was some random. Like he literally would turn his stream on. I remember scrimming with him on standoff, capture the flag, and Clayster would have six viewers. Yeah. Like straight up six people watching him. And he had the long hair and he was like always <laughs> the, yeah, like, the ponytail. Yeah, he was like always, yeah, he was like screaming and stuff. So <laughs> I couldn't tell. And I thought he always played too slow. And I trusted Fears over Clay. So I dropped Clay. And then Clay had a spot at Champs. And out of spite, he refused to play with me. And he'd rather go to champs with a trash yep. team than play with that. me, who could have probably got him a good placing. And like he was doing tryouts every day for like two weeks. <laughs> I just kept spamming him. I'm like, Clay, pick me up. Clay, pick me up. Clay, pick me up. And he just kept ignoring me. And I just watched his streams and he'd be getting smoked with these like trash <laughs> players every day. And I'm like, Clay, just pick me up. I'm sorry for dropping you. I <laughs> fucked up, dude. I'm so sorry. I made a mistake. I listened to a player I shouldn't have listened to. I'm sorry. And he just didn't want to do it. So I couldn't play in Black Ops 2. Yeah. There was, there was nothing to play for without champs, right? Like champs happened in March. I was like, screw it. I'm just going to do college. But when Nade really started to blow up, and I started to take notice of it while I was in college and while I was playing or while I was at the gym every day working out and working my job, I, I, thought, I thought to myself, I was like, well, if Nade shot could blow up because he was like, you know, some random dude making YouTube videos, like yeah. sniping videos and stuff. I'm like, and like he was always a shit talker and he was always just like such a like a I don't know, like he he just wasn't that likable at the time, like when he was like 17 years old. Like no one really like I I personally I didn't like him at all. I was like, this guy's just a, <laughs> like a trash talker and he sucks and like he thinks he's the best and he's not. So like I don't know. But then I saw him blowing up and I was like, wait, if this punk could do this, and this is how I thought when I was 18, I was like, if this punk could do this. There's nothing stopping me from doing this. I'm jacked now. I've won events <laughs> at the highest level. I'm just going to take my muscles and my smarts and my gameplay, and I'm going to just big dick this entire thing and win everything. Screw it, dude. That's a good you know? mindset. So, yeah, so going into Call of Duty Ghost, we had an event before the, the tournament. It was, this, um, it was this event in Dallas, I think, and I went with this team called Strictly Business. They were called like Intake, Clo and Buck, yeah. and I was the best player on their team, and then the owners were like, all right, Doug, you're the best player what do you want to do? I'm like, drop all these kids and like, let me do my thing. Yeah. So they dropped them all for me. And I talked to apathy at the time who at that time, apathy never won anything before, yeah, yeah, yeah. but he was my, in MW3, I was on the best team and apathy was always the player on the team. That was like the rival to my team. Like in capture the flag, he'd always make the plays. He was always the hardest kill. He was mm -hmm. always in the right spot. And I noticed it. And I'm like, something about this apathy guy is really good. So I, I walked up to him at the event and he had like no good team because nobody liked him either. I was like, hey, Apathy, do you want a team going into next year? He's like, yeah, dog. I think you're very good. And uh, obviously you won nationals and I think you were a very good player. So yes, I'm down to play. Like, okay, like, I was like, dude, but like I'm, I'm, I'm in college right now and like I can't waste my time. So like if I'm doing this, Brian, like I have to be number one. And like if I'm putting in this work, you have to do it with me. Like I can't do this without you helping me. He's like, trust me, I'm in college too, dog. And, you know, um, I do not know. I'm with Maria. He was like with Maria for like a year and a half. Like they were yeah. just boyfriend girlfriend, little high school. Like, thing. Yeah, he's like, he's like, he's like, ah, oh, yeah, I'm with Maria, and we're dating <laughs> for two years, and uh, you know, I'm in college, and I'm stopping college too, and I'm playing. I'm like, all right, it's so like, let's go. So like, Ghost came out. Yeah. Day one, him and I every day, three o'clock in the morning, two v two S and D's. I'd be like, Brian, why did you push this here? He'd be like, oh, dog, I did this. I'm like, no, don't do that. He's like, yes, dog, I do. And like, we just go back and forth and argue all the time, like. I would always be on his ass. I was like the most toxic teammate to this guy and he just took it. And I think the thing that changed for us was that we went to the first tournament. We played pretty good. We got like seventh and we lost to a good team and we dropped too quick and we picked up fears. So we go into the yeah. second event, which is Philly. And at Philly, we were playing against Envy, who was a really good team at the time. Yeah. They were like a really, really good top team. And they ended up getting second at champs. But like we went game five, five, five on Octane S and D. And this dude, Apathy, popped a four piece like to win the game. And after that moment, like, I never got on his ass. He was my duo. And I just, I was like, Brian, I gave him a big hug after we won the game. I'm like, that's what I need from you, Brian. I need that from you. Like, yeah. I need you to make those plays, Brian. I know you can do that. And you got to do that every fucking time. So then the next event comes around. We picked up Dito and we're playing against, um, I think we played FaZe in the first round, who was a good team. And we 3 0 them. And then we played against Complexity, who was like the God squad, who never lost anything <laughs> yeah. ever. 
And we had to beat them to get to champs and we 3 0 them. And the reason we 3 0 them was because of Apathy, because we beat them on the first map, it was close. And then the game two, we're down five to two and Apathy clutched a one versus four. And I just looked at him and I'm like, let's fucking win this shit, dude. And we just came back and won the map and then we just put him in the dirt in the game three. Yeah. And then we won that event and then we're just like, he just became my guy after that. Like, I don't know. Brian was a very special part of, of my life. And like, we both were in the same spot at the same time. We both were in college, same year, same graduating class in high school. We both were trying to do the same thing. And we both really pushed each other every single day to be better players and to just put in the extra work and go the extra mile. Because um, especially now in Call of Duty 2, there's a lot more people playing. Yeah. But I just think that if you if you really do go that extra mile and like if you see if you see how far other people go, because like now people really go the extra mile, yeah. but I don't think a lot of people are smart about how they do it. So it's like if you could be smart and go the extra mile, and if you also have the talent to like win, then there's nothing stopping you from being the best. So yeah. that was really my vibe. Like I saw Nate shot doing it and I saw him blowing up and I wanted to be on Optic, but he wouldn't let me. So I thought phase would be the next big thing. Yeah. So obviously, because of Brian and because of my partnership with him and us being such a dominant two, like a two-man roster in yeah. a four-man game, we were really able to just climb the ranks super fast. Like having two quick and fears and then dropping two quick and picking up Saints. Because Saints left Envy, who was a top team, and Saints believed in me and Apathy at the time. Um, and we convinced him to leave, and he was a huge part of our success too. So then me, Saints, and Apathy were a really good trio. And then we picked up Dito as that missing piece, and we just climbed the ranks really fast. We were able to win. We beat FaZe all the time. So um, FaZe wanted me on that team because, you know, we, we really climbed it fast. Yeah. And then, you know, I just, when I was on FaZe, I did the same mentality. I had Apathy with me, and, you know, we just kept winning. Like, nobody could really stop us, but... Um, it was a short-lived thing, honestly. I, w I didn't get to play on FaZe for more than like eight months. So yeah, it is what it is. And that's crazy because a lot of people, even for me, they're like, yo, FaZe attached. Like they always just see me and they'll think of FaZe. And I'm sure with you, a lot of people will see you and think of like FaZe sensor as well and always say that. Because um, with FaZe, you're not just joining like a Call of Duty team. It's much more than that. So how was your time on FaZe with Call of Duty, of course, but then with the other side, like the content, the YouTube and all the other stuff that uh, you really got into? Well, like I came back into COD with like no following and I wanted to be number one, but I was in the same shoes I'm in right now. Like just, you know, at the bottom of the barrel. And obviously I have really good players that I'm playing with now, but yeah. um, I was like, I had nothing. I just had apathy. So I wanted to be this big guy like Nade Shot. And um, I knew I needed to be on a big team because I couldn't do it without the backing of a team. Yeah. I had to be on a team. And the only teams at the time was Optic and FaZe. So my thinking was, like I was winning and I was dominant on this random team called Strictly Business and I had all this power and I could do what I wanted. So obviously when FaZe wanted me on their team, I just took it and ran with it. So it was like, it was me, Formal, um, Proofy and Dito. And Proofy sketched on us before he could even play an event because Optic wanted him. Mm -hmm. So it was me, Formal and Dito. And Formal was like climbing the ranks too. And I, I really, I knew where Formal was going to go. Like it was really obvious to me that he was going to keep on doing big things. Yeah. And he kept on getting on better and better teams. He went from like uh, fear to team caliber to yeah. me. So I was like, all right, like he's going to win with me because I'm the best and I'm not going to lose. And this kid is good. So I trust yeah. him. And I had, I knew if I had apathy and Formal, I'd win, but I didn't have app at the same time I had Formal, which I think is mm. the reason I couldn't win with him. But um, I knew that when I got on phase that, I had to make the most of it and I had to stay at the top. So yeah. we, you know, we won their first major and we won the second major for them like right after. But um, I just knew like if I started making content, cause it took us like six months to get to an event and win it because there wasn't that many events. Uh, we got like fourth at the first one and then we won like the next one, I think, but formal sketching us right after, which yeah. is fine. Cause like we just, I just picked up apathy again and I won. So I was, I was cool with it, but I just knew that if I made YouTube videos every day with this phase in my tag, like just being phase sensor, if I just make YouTube videos every single day, just whatever, like a two minute clip, if it was a Call of Duty listening, like my first ever video was from a 2K and it's the first video on my YouTube channel. Like it's 2K where we played against Optic and I just completely destroyed him. I was like, oh, if I title this phase versus Optic, it's gonna get views. Yeah. And like it got Definitely. a shit ton of hate because like phase didn't have a, a, a following back then for competitive and Optic, like if you posted anything about them, they would all hate it. So yeah. it had a lot of hate. And I was like, yeah, guys, like I'm phase sensor and we played optic today. It was a really good gameplay. Please leave a like, have a great day. And I kind of wanted to do that every day. And I knew like the second I could win with phase, if I made the right content, right when I won with them, it would really boost me to a different level. So yeah. when I won with them, I started making really good content. Then in AW, I knew when the new COD came out, if I took advantage of that, it could help me. So I was, I was going to the phase house, making YouTube videos like apex and like making call of duty videos. Cause I was the phase captain. 
And then we played Optic in the finals, and I looked at all those guys, and I'm like, oh, this is it. Like, Nade shot was at his peak in, in the AW fi- in the AW opener, yeah. and Trump and Nade were together. I just looked at them, and I'm like, oh, like, this is that moment where I become that fucking guy. Like, yeah. I knew it. I was like, this is it. Like, this is when it happens. Like, I've waited for this, and I thought about this. This was premeditated. I put in so much time for this moment. Um we came from the losers bracket. We knocked you guys out last map, five yeah, five round and, eleven. Re, I remember that. If replays, if replays just kill me off the bomb a half second earlier, yeah, you guys move on. That was a crazy we series because I remember we played you in pool play. We won three zero, and then we played you in the in the losers bracket, and we went down 2-0, won the next two maps, and then brought it all the way back to round eleven, five five, and. You guys it really came us. down to like it came down to like 15 seconds yeah. left in a four versus four, and Slasher said, "Put the bomb down, Doug," and I said, "All right, I'm putting it down." and Replay started shooting at me. I don't know what he missed, but he missed a bullet. And because he missed that one bullet, it cost you guys. And like, we just ran from there. Like we just didn't, didn't want to lose. So we kept on rolling and rolling and rolling and we played yeah. optic. And I'm like, I'm like, all right, we, we like, if we don't win this then like, I'm just going to be second. And if I'm second, then I'm a nobody. Like, yeah. that's just the only thing I could think of. It's like, if I'm not first, then I'm nothing. So like, I have to be number one. So again, like, I don't know, we beat them. I like made the play to do it. And I just knew exactly what I needed to do. I was like, I need to make a video coming home, <laughs> opening a supply drop, having somebody Photoshop sensors thumbs on it, and then show this clip of me absolutely shitting on these fucking dweebs, these <laughs> trash players, like absolutely fucking smoking them. And I got to talk yeah. a lot of shit because all these guys talk so much shit to me, formal sketched on me. They all think they're better than me. Yeah. Skump doesn't think I'm that good. And I just fucking destroy them to win. So I'm like, fuck these guys. I'm taking this energy and I'm going to like make some really funny videos out of it. Yeah. And then that's really what took me to that level where I started having a couple hundred thousand subs on YouTube and I started becoming something and an identity, but it got taken away from me right away, Dylan. Like yeah, I immediately, I the same night, like the same night we won the event, Tommy like came up to me. He's like, we're going to make Pat captain. So I knew at that point I was fucked. I was yeah. like, I'm done. They, they want Pat and he's just going to ruin their team because he doesn't want to win as much as I do. He's not going to be as big on social media as I'm going to be. And they just didn't see it that way. Like Banks and Tommy were just like, Pat's the goat. He had the most yeah. wins because it was eight for crim. And I was like, no, he's not. Like he's not as motivated. He doesn't want to work as hard and he's not going to make you as much money. I could have put so much money into phase into phase's name. Like the way Nate shot grew optic, I could have done a tenfold with, with phase. So they just gave me the keys to it, but yeah. uh, it just couldn't happen. So that's that's really like the lowest point of my life. It was such a bittersweet moment because I like worked so hard to get to the top and like everything went my way for it to happen. And then I knew exactly what needed to happen. But then Tommy and Banks just decided like, no, we like we're not just gonna, you know, we're just gonna move on. So it really like hit hard. Yeah, no, that sucks because it's like everything that happened, everything that led up to that moment, and that was the moment where it was just this changed your life. Literally winning that event changed your life. All the stuff that was gonna come with that changed your life. But then it also that same night you learned that X is gonna be a captain and you know how it is in Call of Duty when your cat when someone else is captain and they may not want to team with you or wherever, maybe you, you see some differences. Um yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be bad. You can get get left off a roster or whatever. Maybe I mean, Dylan, it's, it's the same thing now. I mean, look, five years later, like I go into this cod, nobody wants to play with aches, and I'm like, Pat, like I will team with you, but you need to put in the work. And he's my duo. Zed and Dens hit me up the team. I'm like, Pat, we should play with Zed and Dens. He's like, okay, we played Florida in a tournament. We almost six zero them. Yeah. And then he just decides he, it's been a week, and he still has left me on red. He just sketched on me for Saints Insight and Classic. And for no reason, like he didn't say anything. He still hasn't texted me back. So when we played him there, I had to make sure I put him in the dirt. Um, so I, I don't know what he's doing. Like he just, he just like did a backwards move. You know, I, yeah. I don't know why he does that. Like he just has such a lack of respect for the grind that I have and the winning mentality that I have. So, I mean, if he wants to dig his own grave, he did it back with phase back then when, um, you know, he was, he was only on phase for like two more events after that. And then he got dropped off the team and then you got picked up with, I think Zuma and Clayster and all them, yeah. right? Like. Or, or I, I think you got on that team well, later it was, on. Yeah, I got on later. It was like Hugh can enable. Hugh can enable. Well, enable was the longest one on it. So enable was on Zuma. It. No, Zuma was on it first. I think. I think Zuma got on it with. Uh, no. Oh yeah, because Zuma went to Slasher Envy. And, Zuma went yeah, to Envy Slasher, and then went to Phase. Slasher and and Aix picked up Enable and Zuma, so it was Enable. Yeah. And then they picked up Zuma. And they then picked up Hugh. They, they got Hugh, Hugh and they got Slasher, Zuma. Slasher, Enable. Hugh Slasher and Zuma. Enable Zuma. Yeah. And, and then, then they dropped I, yeah. those two for Clay and you, and then you guys went on your run. Yeah, no, that was crazy. And um, so where'd you go from that point, from being on phase at the top to not being on phase anymore? And with the YouTube and Call of Duty, like, I'm sure it must have been ripping you apart, like which way you want to go. Do you want to get hundreds of thousands, millions of views and make all this cash? 
or play Call of Duty. So like the next couple of years, like what was your game plan? Um, well, I was still in phase and I was making YouTube videos, yeah. still playing oh, yeah, competitive yeah. COD, but uh, they kind of like just like I, I had so many talks with Tommy. I'm like, yo, I'm your nade shot. You know, I'm your guy. Like, I'm going to do this thing for you. Like Nate's the only one who's ever done this before. And I'm going to be bigger than him. I'm going to do it better than him. I'm going to learn from him and do it better. And they just didn't want me to be that guy, I guess, at least for competitive COD. But they they obviously like, they didn't want to kick me out of phase because of yeah. me bringing the first two championships in, me growing a social platform through competitive COD. They obviously still liked me. I just don't, I still to this day don't know why they did what they did. It just didn't make any sense. It was a stupid business move on their end. And I still don't understand why they did that. But um, they obviously kept me around for content. So I was going to the house all the time, making videos and just, you know, doing the best I could and just taking the uh, advantage of a situation. You know, it was, yeah. I live in New York. The house is 20 minutes away from me. Um, Blaziken and Tika were texting me every day. Adapt's hitting me up. They're telling me to come over to make content with them. We're having yeah. a lot of fun. We're getting views. So now I'm going to try this content thing. But I still wanted to play. I wanted to do the content and still play, like kind of like Scump, but do it bigger than Scump. You know, like Scump is still uploading every day and streaming yeah. every day. I always wanted to put in the extra mile and the extra effort, but it's impossible to do it if I don't have the org backing me or the people around me. You know, if I have the right team, the right situation, I could take Call of Duty even to this day right now. I could take this whole league to another level and make all of us so much more money because I could blow our league up. Yeah. Um, but I just need to be in that situation and be enabled to. So it's been tough because for five years, I've wanted to be in the situation where I could just imagine if Nade was still playing today, Dill, how much bigger this league would be and how much more money we could all make. I know that I could do it bigger than him and I could do yeah, it better, I but I need the right, I need the people behind me to do it. I have the knowledge in my head. I know how it needs to get done, but if I'm not on a pro roster, if I'm not playing on a starting team, uh, if I'm playing on a starting team, I'm going to win first of all. But even if I'm not winning, just the journey that I could show through the content could really take this league to another level. So that's what I wanted to do before we even had a franchise league, but obviously going off and doing my relationship content and doing YouTube content and blowing up, it was great making all this money, having fun, traveling, going on vacations every other week. But like, I just knew that wasn't where I wanted to be in my life and yeah. it wasn't where I, where I wanted to go. So um, now I'm here. Nice. So what was the like of official point where you're just like, I need to go back to competitive Call of Duty? Because I, I remember there being times where you were saying like you were on phase, but you couldn't play for other teams because you're technically on phase. And it was just like yeah. a whole mix up. Like, how did you figure out that situation and then finally make your decision to leave phase and pretty much pursue Call of Duty full time again? Well, I kind of left phase for two reasons. One was because the guy who was running phase at the time, like called me out to the Hamptons with the yeah. current CEO, the current CEO of phase and him who was running it. And Tommy and Banks was there and Rain was there. So it was like everyone who was important in phase was there. And every year, like in AW, I was really hurt that they dropped me off the it's really hurt that they went in a different direction, but you guys were winning. So like, what am I going to do? I'm not going to, you know, step yeah. on your toes and y'all are winning. Then in black ops three, you guys didn't win anything. So I'm going into IW and I'm like, Hey, this roster didn't win anything for a year. Like when can I get my chance again? Cause they knew how important it was to me. And they kept on like, they, they, they didn't, they didn't give me closure. That was the problem. Like if they just said, Doug, like we're never going to put you on this team and we're just going to go in this direction. Like they really screwed me over in that sense, because yeah. if they just gave me some sort of closure, then I would have either left phase earlier or I would have never wanted to compete again. I would have made the decision a lot faster, but yeah. they kind of let it linger for so long. And I'm a very direct guy. I don't like to beat around the bush when it comes to anything. So I would sit down and have these hard talks. And obviously your roster didn't win for two years. So I was like, all right, like if, if their roster hasn't won for two years, I need to play from the beginning of this game. Like I, I sat out last year in IW because I didn't want to leave phase. I sat out last year in Black Ops 3 because I didn't yeah. want to leave phase. Now I'm going into World War II and it's boots on the ground. It's 4v4 COD, like whatever. I went on boots. I went on jetpacks. I don't really care what COD it was. It didn't matter to me, but I sat down with them. They're like, yeah, like, like come out to the Hamptons. Like we want to talk to you. I was like, okay. So I go out to the Hamptons. I'm sitting at this six man table with them. I didn't even say anything. The, the guy who's running phase at the time just stopped. And he's like, he's like, all right, so Doug, you're getting the keys to this team. We have Zoom and Attach on the team. You could drop them if you want to drop them. It's totally up to you. And personally, Dylan, I wanted to play with you and, and Tommy, but you guys never wanted to play with me, but it's fine. Like They're like, you have the keys to the team. Yeah. So like my, my first reaction that. is, I'm going to go to Zoom and Attach and tell them, yo, I, still want, I want you guys to stay on phase. Like, I, I really think that we can win together. Like yeah. I really wanted to play with you, Dylan, before you won champs. And I always knew Zoom was really good. So like, I always wanted to play with you guys. And if you guys didn't want to play with me, I'd be like, all right, like then you could leave phase and I'll just win again with other players. I'll pick up apathy again and I'll do my thing. I didn't go. So it's whatever. And they're like, you have the keys to the team. If the other players on this, they made this very clear to me. They're like, if the other players on this team, and they're talking about you and Tommy, if they don't want you on this team, 
then they could leave. Like it's your team. You have power on this team. You have control. We're giving you this season. It's all you, Doug. Like you yeah. have to put in the work though. You must be ready. And I kind of like laughed at them. I'm like, you're really going to question my work? Like, look, if I put in the work and I get smoked, you could drop me whenever you want, but it's never going to happen because when I put in the work, I don't get smoked. Yeah. I win. It's just how I am. So if I have the org phase and I have the power to pick up my players, I'm going to be number one. And if I'm not number one, then I'm going to be number one at some point. It's going to happen. I'm going to win. That's my mind. That's like my ideology in my head. So I'm like, this is fucking great. Like, awesome. Yeah. I started like crying on my drive home. I was like, literally <laughs> crying. I had to wait three years for this. I'm like, this is amazing. Like, finally, dude, like shit. I've been waiting for three years to do this thing. And then, um, I don't know, like I, they clearly didn't tell you what they told me, you know, because yeah. you guys had a different opinion on it. And I, they were like, oh, like we want replays. We want Priesta. We like the Priesta. Oh, we want replays. Replays are with Priesta. I'm like, okay, that's great. But like, I shouldn't even have to ask you guys because they told me that this is my team. Like, yeah. so I this kept was... going to the owner. Yeah, I just went straight to him. I'm like, I'm not going to argue with these players. Like, it's just stupid. Like, look, if you're going to tell me it's my team and I could drop these guys, like they're telling me they want to have a different team. So what is it? Are they having their own team on phase? Am I having my team on phase? Like you can't give me. Yeah, you can't. You can't do both. Like there's one or the other. It's yeah. It's like yeah. If they want to have their own team on phase, then you got to make it clear to them that they're gone, or you got to make it clear to me that you just lied to me. Like yeah. just tell me that you're wrong and like you lied and you don't want to do it. Like I'd much rather have you be honest with me than linger it on and string me along. So they kind of just strung me along, and they just didn't like. They just didn't give me a direct answer with anything. They didn't tell me that they were going to move forward with your team. They didn't tell me that I was going to be captain. It just made no sense. And I'm like, like, what am I supposed to do? I'm going to play. So like, I'm just going to do my thing and I'm going to make my own team. Yeah. So I, I stayed in phase. I made my own team, but I think the moment, like, obviously that really, really hindered my relationship. Like I love phase to death. The guy who made those decisions isn't a part of phase anymore. Yeah, he, and I know Tommy, yeah. I know Tommy very well. I know banks. I know they didn't really like, like if they could have said like, yo, like Doug's getting the team, but I don't even think they care that much to be honest. Like, I really just don't think they, they thought it mattered too much. Rain was a really big advocate for it. He was like, yeah, this is bullshit. Like you should have the team. Yeah. But Tommy and Banks didn't really care. I always got strung along and I was like, all right, like whatever. But I think the biggest thing, because obviously like, obviously like I made my whole life with FaZe and I'm very loyal to who I'm with, especially people who helped me make my career. So I'm always going to love FaZe and have love for it. But yeah. the biggest thing for me was when I got a pro contract to join complexity, they were going to give me $7,000 a month and I was going to be in the pro league. So it's like, all right, I'm either in the pro league or I'm not. Yeah. So I told FaZe, yo, I got this offer to get 7,000 a month to be in a pro team in complexity. You guys didn't help me whatsoever throughout this whole season. I had to work my ass off every day with no help. I had to pay $10,000 in my own pocket to salary players because nobody wanted to play with me because I didn't play for three years. Yeah. I got back to this point where I'm getting an offer to be in the pro league through my hard work, my grit, my determination, and my resiliency. So I want to take this. And if this means I need to leave phase, then I'm going to leave phase. And they never responded to me. They never told me anything. But then I heard that they didn't like the fact that I joined complexity. So I'm like, what is it here, dude? Like, tell yeah, me you don't like, want me to do it, man. Yeah. Tell me, like, you you gotta be honest with me, man. Like, I'm sitting here telling you what my goals are. I'm achieving my goals, and you're not helping me, working with me, or communicating with me. So, I was like, dude, like, I'm sorry I hurt your guys' feelings. I'm sorry I joined complexity as a pro, and I'm still phase censor. I will take phase out of my name and leave tomorrow. But you have to talk to me and tell me. Like, I love phase. I never want to leave the brand, but give me some communication. I need some help here. So, um. Yeah, I, I still stayed in phase after that, though, you know, because yeah. in, in the next year, I didn't get to compete. It was me and Dashy looking for three. Jason Lake didn't know what he wanted to do. And I was like, Jason, honestly, like Dashy wants to go to Optic, like sell him to Optic, make some cash and just get out of COD, dude. You know, like you don't want to be involved in this anymore. Yeah. He wanted to build around me and Dashy. Dashy really wanted to go to Optic. I'm yeah. like, I don't want to I don't want this guy to play with me, like sell him to Optic, let him do his thing, let him have some fun. I'll figure something else out. And I just, I had some options. Like I was going to be the captain of EG and that got finessed away. And I'm like, all right, like whatever. I'm just going to take this year off. And I stayed in phase. Yeah. I did blackout content every day, but um, I had to leave once it became the subliners, like the Call of Duty League and the New York subliners. Um, and again, like, I, I don't know why these teams give me, Dylan, like the owner of the, the New York subliners literally said, we want you to be the face of our team and we're going to let you play. And like, we all know how that went. So it's like, look, I don't know why these situations keep happening, but I'm very clear with the people I'm around. And if yeah. you don't want me to be around you, don't use me for my social following. Just tell me, we want you for your social following. Like Hastro told me this. I hit up every league team. Every league team wanted me to join them as a sub. Hastro was very direct. He was like, Doug, 
I will sign you right now as a content creator and I won't think twice. I'll give you a great deal and you'll be a content creator for Empire. But I'm telling you right now, Doug, we have their set roster. It's not changing and you're not going to get a lick of playing time on our team. No disrespect. I want you to do your thing. I want you to be happy, but I just want to be honest with you, transparent with you. This is our squad and we're sticking with it. Yeah. So if you want to join, you'll be a content creator. And I was like, yeah, I appreciate that, Mike, but I really want to play. Then I go to New York and they tell me that they want to make me the face of the team. And I'll get to stay home in New York and I get a great deal. So I'm like, this is awesome. Let me do it. Like, I, I don't know. Like, I, <laughs> yeah, I don't actually, know. It, it drives me crazy inside, dude. Yeah, wait, I actually think, truly think and know, because I'm pretty sure in Modern Warfare from the beginning, like if you would have took Modern Warfare like you took this season and grinded like with a team and got practice from the start, I truly think you would have been on New York in the starting roster 100%. And I'm, you could talk to everyone else on the roster and get their opinions. But I think that if you would have been playing like streaming like now, uh, you would have gone to the team for sure. But I think the rules were a little different at the time. Like it was probably harder for you to find teammates, right? Because like it the was, sub rules were like conflicting. It was impossible, dude. Yeah. yeah, it was impossible. There was no chance. Like there was just nothing. Because the, the the world changed throughout that year, Dylan. Like in the beginning of the yeah. year, our owner from New York was like, Doug, you're going to be going to all the events with the team, like every single event. So because you're going to every event, you can't play in challengers. Like that's yeah. how it started. Because I told him, I was like, yo, let me play challengers. Like I'll be a sub on this team and I'll play challengers. Like this is great. Like whatever. Like it's the same concept now. It's like, dude, like I'm gonna do my thing in challengers. I'll be a great player. If the roster sucks, if they need to make a change, if I get a tryout, I'm gonna kill it. I'm gonna take the spot because I'm gonna earn it. But like, like, like let me play it. They're like, nope, you're gonna travel because we need to have one sub that could play in challengers, one sub that could travel. And I was like, oh, let me play in challengers. They're like, oh, well, we're gonna have to affiliate and you're we're gonna have to have a second team or we're gonna have to salary it. I was like, okay, so then like I'll figure out another way of getting practice. I'll just play tens every day. Like, I, I don't know. So it, it, like, it, I think a lot of it was just like the league, just not having it structured down. I, I told the league so many times, like, I was like, yo, you just got to let us rock, man. Like we're sitting here doing yeah. nothing all day. Like you just got to let us rock and let us play because it's only going to help your league out. Like this league's only going to work if we have more people growing on social media and more people getting eyeballs on this league or else it's all just going to crumble. Yeah. And you just got to let us all go. Like, look, I'm never going to be able to be a starter unless if I got blessed, it's never going to happen. I got to go earn it. So like the league finally opened up and I think that they're doing a great job and they're making it a lot better for all of us involved and going to 4v4 is great. So I'm really excited for it all. But again, like I think the biggest things that hold true to me is, is like, I don't know why these orgs want to give me these promises. Like, I think they just see me as a big social media guy and they're like, oh, like we could just tell them these things and then sell sponsorships. And it's like, dude, like, just tell me, like, be like Hastro, just be honest with me. You know, just tell yeah. me you don't want me there as a player. You know, Seattle did it too. They're like, yo, we'll give you a sub spot, but we're not going to let you play. It's like, Awesome. Like, thank you. Oh, yeah, just so, like straight up with you. You got you got your answer of what you wanted pretty much instead of yeah, because why, why would still why would I leave FaZe Clan and everything that I've built with this team and everything that I, I love about FaZe and like my life? Like I li yeah. literally my whole life was from FaZe. So it's yeah. like the only reason I'm gonna leave is if the offer is really freaking good. Yeah. And New York promised me a great offer, you know, and it just like it's just false promises again. So a lot of learning lessons, Dill. Just got to be very, <laughs> off, very uh, cautious with it. And at the end of the day, like you just got to be undeniable and just, yeah. just put yourself in a situation where you're just undeniable, honestly. Yeah, I'm not going to lie. Honestly, listening to you talk has gotten me hyped, to be honest. Like, I feel like I'm ready to go work out and punch a hole through a wall or something. So, yeah, you're going to be hyped, no lie. Um, but I think you were a really big advocate and you definitely had the biggest and loudest voice about challengers changing or like the challengers rules changing. So I think you helped a lot of people that are going to try and become professionals in the future in call of duty, because I think the rules were definitely messed up last year as well, where like you couldn't play. Cause honestly, it seemed like subs were getting the, the $50,000 guaranteed contract. And then they weren't able to play COD. They would just kind of have to sit there and they couldn't improve and they couldn't go to these events and play. So it was kind of like, is that 50 K you're worth it for that one you're getting. Whereas if you could play and then maybe make, 100 200 300 one day and be a pro like is it worth it to just sit out and take that 50k but you can't improve or play caught at all like it was it was definitely messed up but i think that's what now, now with, it's great to be a sub dylan yeah. it's awesome to be yeah a sub now it's great you know like yeah. it's, it's awesome yeah so pretty much i think you were a big voice in getting that change so shout out to you a lot of these people should be thanking you because you really helped a lot and um then ending off of that first season on the team and everything, I know you talked about some of the issues like that was that was with everything. How did you how are you going to try and make it so that doesn't happen again where you get on the wrong team or 
you don't have the right players by your side. Like, how did you make sure that it's not going to happen again? So you're going to get what you want and uh, achieve what you're going for this next season. Well, I just knew that if I had restrictions, it was going to suck. You know, yeah. like I didn't want to be restricted. I did not want to join any league teams at all. Unless if like, like last starting, year, like not, well, I mean, New York was like, we want you to be the face of the team. And then I have a call with them. They're like, what do you want to do next year? I'm like, I want to play. And they're like, oh, we can't have you play on our roster. We're going to have to reconstruct the whole roster for you. And it's like, you have Clay, Zuma, and Mac. You need a player like me. You picked up Asim. He plays like me. You have Hydra. We don't even know how he plays. Like, don't give me this. Like, we have to reconstruct our roster. Just tell me you don't want me to play on the team or the players don't want me to play on the team. So it's like, no, like, I'm out. Like, I'm gone. I'm going to go do my thing. I don't need this money. Like, I'm here because I want to win. Period. That's it. So, like, not having a restriction is awesome. Being able to just play with whoever I want to play with. Um, I had an idea of who I wanted to play with going into the season. I wanted to play with Aches. I wanted to play with Fire. I wanted to play with Goon. Um, and Fire obviously was off the board. And then Goonjar was off the board. So it was me and Aches. And then Zed and Dens hit us up. And I'm like, I didn't even think about Zed and Dens because I thought they were in Europe. Yeah. And I'm like, this could, this could be great. Like, I know Zed's a grinder. He plays to win. Dens is a slower AR. We're going to need a player like him because I didn't even think Dens was like, I didn't even have him on my board because I thought he was in Europe. I had no idea what he was doing. Yeah. So when they hit me up the team, I'm like, oh, this is great. Like these guys are players who are all about the grind and they have been every single day. They get on when we have scrims. There's no shit. It's just grind, get better, work as a team, get yeah. better. You know, we've been scrimming for like six days now and every single day we just get better. The roles make sense, you know um Gundra is now on the board he texts me at three in the morning he's like yo i don't got a team now like i got screwed over i was gonna join the league and i'm not so yeah. i'm like i'm like all right like let's do this thing then so it all worked out and i i just think like i just know for a fact that if you're good enough to be in the league you're gonna be in the league and i know that i'm good enough to be in the league yeah. and i know that if i put in the hours to be in the league like when it comes to tournaments and matches i'm always gonna show up and i'm always gonna play well and especially when it comes down to literally winning a game i do it better than anyone else does so it really just comes down to just putting in the reps every day, working with some good guys. And I'm just really happy to be around some good guys because it's been a long time since I've had this. And it's really refreshing to play with these players. Like, I just look back at my Lightning Pandas team in, in World War II. Like, I wasn't on good teams that whole year. Gunjar picked me up. I got on a good team. We got top eight. Yeah. And then I got, an, I got a league offer right after that. So, you know, like, re regardless of what happens, like, this team that I'm with right now, all of us, our goal is to be back in the league. But obviously, on the day-to-day -day basis of grinding, we're all trying to improve and get better. And um, I think the thought for me of just knowing that all these players, like I look at these lists of all these amateur players and all these ex-pro players that are all trying to get back in the league, and there's only 48 players in this league now. Everyone has the same goal, get back in the Call of Duty League, right? But not only get back in the league, but also be on a good team in the league, right? So the way I look at it is like, whenever I'm playing the game, I always want to improve. I always want to get better. Yeah, but... Like, what is the best players not in the league doing? And how can I do what they're doing, but more than them? You know, yeah. like, that's how I always look at it. How could I be the best, most prepared, best teammate, most intense, like most wanting and desire, best clutch player? Like, just be the all around player yeah, that the, every yeah. team wants. You every know, team, like that's how everyone wants to play with. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So that, that's just really like the thoughts that go through my head on this day to day basis. Yeah. And it was kind of crazy too, because of course, cutting back from what was it? five players on a team with 12 teams so that's 60 players to 12 just instantly gone out of the league and then no expansion teams either like it definitely hurt a lot of people's opportunities of playing in the league and stuff and i was kind of surprised there was no expansion teams either hopefully next season there will be to give more opportunities for just players in the league in general because there's a lot of people that are deserving to be in the league like we see a lot of big name players who probably good, who are still good enough to be in the league and it just sucks that some people aren't going to be in like it's it's crazy like especially like Wuskin, scraps who had great seasons got like top four at champs and then now they're just not in the league from what we know now and it's just it's kind of crazy but uh hopefully with the expanded teams it opens a lot more opportunities up for people to make it worth it for everyone but um yeah wait going into the challengers event there's one this weekend right i think you were telling me about yeah, this Saturday, so in three days from now. Okay. Why is this like, tell me why this is very important to like kickstart your year for like everyone to hear. I want to, I want everyone to know just how important this event this weekend is. I mean, this is the event. I think like some of these lead teams haven't officially picked up their squads. Like I think New York hasn't picked up their fourth. 100 Thieves hasn't picked up their fourth. Paris hasn't picked up their roster officially, right? Like all these teams officially don't have their fourth. 
And then also, I think the most important thing, Dio, because I think most of these teams you and I both know are basically set. But the most yeah. important thing is that we all know with 12 teams in the league, there's, there could be like 60 teams in the league. There's always going to be teams that play bad no of matter course. what. Yeah. So there's always going to be changes happening because we have these 14-day contracts now. So I think a lot of these teams are waiting to sign their substitute because they want to see who's going to do good in this first tournament. And then they all got noticed that there's going to be a scouting series coming up in yeah. like a week and a half or two weeks from now where all the teams are like required to go to it. So if they're all required to go to it, why pick up a sub now if they could just wait until after this is over? So playing yeah. in this first tournament, playing in that scouting series, I think the tournament's probably going to be more important because we all know that the scouting series is just like glorified eights with the draft. It's like, I don't know. Yeah, if, I'm a, it's not, if, I'm a, if I'm a general manager of a team, I'm looking at who's playing well in these tournaments. In this you know? challenge that's tournament, really what yes, that's it. That is, yeah. That's definitely so I, and then on top of that, too, uh, your pro points from last year carry over to this mm. year. So we're going to have a good seed because me, Goon, Zed, and Denz all have a lot of pro points. Yeah. Uh, Goon has like 80K. Like we're going to be like the third or fourth seed. So we're going to have a pretty good bracket. Yeah. And we have to take advantage of it. Like it's super important that we put in the time every day. We learn this game in and out. Um, you know, it's obviously a lot to learn. We've only been playing for like five days now. Like the, the team that got second in that Pharaoh tournament has been grinding their asses off. They yeah. were the first scrim we had. They put us in a blender. Yeah. And I was like, yo, have you guys been grinding? Like, yeah, we've been on our grind. I'm like, well, yeah, it's our first day. They're like, yeah, like Jeb told us. So it's like they're so far ahead because yeah. of how much time they put in. But obviously when you're putting three-day scrims every day, you catch up really fast. So um, there's going to be some really good challenger uh, competition. There's going to be some really good teams and challengers. But if you could play well in this first tournament, keep keep getting those pro points, keep having a high seed, you're either A, going to be on a top team in challengers throughout the year and continuously have chances to prove yourself, or B, you'll get a sub spot offer. Um, which obviously could be great for your career as well because you know there's going to be league teams that are going to suck and make roster yeah. changes. It's just how has, that people have to lose. People have to lose. Someone has to lose. Someone yeah. wins, someone loses. It's just how it goes. It's going to be middle of the pack, winners and losers. Uh, so you just want to be able to take advantage of that. Like I think last year, Mac did a great job with you guys. Obviously, yeah. I don't even think he won a Challengers event, but obviously he, he was got, so like, good. Second. I think he got second and won one and did like, Minnesota. pretty well. Yeah. Yeah, so it's like, oh, like this guy's playing really well. Let's pick him up. And then yep. he comes into the league. He wins an event in the league. Awakening again. Another player yep. who won like one three. challenger event. And then won three, three. three events. Yeah. So you just want to – Pharaoh too. I mean, Pharaoh, rest in peace, wasn't in the league in the beginning of the year. He was yeah. thinking about quitting. He got back in and him and Awakening come take over. So there's yeah. people in this challenger system that are better than people in the league right now who aren't going to be in the league until these teams start playing bad. These players prove themselves. And it's just super important to understand that moment and uh do your job you know if you yeah. do your job that's that's really what's going to count so and these players are smart you know the pro league players are smart the owners are smart well the owners are still learning how to run the scene but i think the managers like the brian saints of the world and the mud dogs of the world and the coaches and you know jcap and the players in general they all know what to look for in a winning player so um they're going to be watching you know it's their yeah. job they're going to be watching these tournaments they're going to see who's performing and that's where they're going to make their moves on who they want to pick up yeah, what do you think uh, the league can do better to just grow uh, the pro scene, challenger scene, and just everything just to last for 10 years from now to when we're maybe coaching or casting, whatever it may be? Like, What do you think the steps now the league has to take to just keep expanding? I think there's two different things they need to do. They need to capitalize on Battle Royale with Warzone and convert a lot of these Battle Royale people into competitive Call of Duty fans, yeah. which they're trying to do with these Warzone tournaments. But I think the most important thing is why is the league here in the first place? Is because of Optic, Scump, Hector, and Age Shot. So you need to have more people like that. So I, I've yeah. I, I was just talking to Seth the other day about this. Like late night, we were texting each other, and I was like, "Yo, we need people like Octane. We need people like Simp. We need people like um, Envoy. Like Envoy's starting to do well. Like we need yeah. these people to start making more content, and we need to start making these people our rivals. Like literally, like on social media, like." there needs to be bigger fan bases where people could compete against each other. Like when I go on and watch the NFL today, the Steelers and Ravens play, they're a huge rivalry, you know, they're division rivals with each other. And yeah. everyone knows about that because NFL has been around for a hundred seasons. Call of Duty has only been around for one technically. So we need to have more rivals. We need to have more platforms. We need people to do more than just be players. Uh, NBA is a great example as well. You got Magic Johnson. Um, you got Larry Bird. You know, you got these guys who came in, then you had Michael Jordan come in. Without these guys, the NBA wouldn't be a thing today. Like, yeah. I don't think people realize NBA wouldn't be a thing today without Larry, Magic, um, uh, even the people before that, but Michael Jordan. Like, you need these people that either are really good at what they do or in gaming, it's a little bit different. They don't have to be the best in what they do. 
Nate shot wasn't the best player, but he was the most popular guy. You know, like you need people yeah. like this to be in the scene. You need these people to come grow the scene and make it bigger so that in 10 years from now, people could just come and join the league, get a million dollar contracts and just perform well and get brand deals and get a million followers on social media. Like that's how it's going to have to be. And that can't happen without having people make content, having players work harder than just be players. And um, obviously on top of that, converting battle Royale fans into competitive fans is a major thing too. So I think those are the two things the league really needs to pay attention to. Yeah. All right. Noted. I got, we got to start talking more shit to each other. Everyone in the league has to start hating each other. Doug, send me a list of the people that, that you hate. And uh, I can, I can make some tweets. I can send some tweets out, you know, try and talk some more shit and get the league more entertaining. Cause I think that's, that's especially what helped build or build call of duty in like black ops Two, where it was like the optic, they were never winning, but they were doing well. And then they had like the aches and the crim on Cole, who were the villains who won everything. And people just love watching it. And then Call of Duty like blew up to a whole new level. But like Slasher said, the community is too soft nowadays. The community, everyone's a GOAT. Everyone's the best. Everyone's super nice. So maybe we just got to flip it on his head and start going crazy. But um, yeah, and if you talk shit, then people get really like personally deeply affected by it. You know, yeah. it's like god man <laughs> like come on dude like we all want the same things here we all want to yeah. win we all want to make money we all want to say we're the best right so i think i think everyone just needs to like like how slasher said just toughen up a little bit and um <laughs> learn That's learn to take it different like learn to take the in-game like if you have in-game trash talk it's not like i do a lot of in-game trash talk i was shooting at his body all day long today like he was just getting destroyed i don't even think he went positive in the map to be honest with you dill he's using an ar <laughs> and literally not going positive on a single map and i'm like yep Typical Pat, he doesn't want to win. And, you know, I'm going to keep saying that to him. And look, if Pat really wants to win and start trying hard, that's great because then we need more Patty P in the league and we need him to be playing well. So, look, I love Pat outside of the game, but I, I just, in the game, I'm going to talk shit. There's certain players I'm going to talk shit. And yeah. it doesn't mean that I hate you. It's just, you know, it's a competitive sport. And that's one of the things that drives me as a player. And I think a lot of us have that in us. You know, I, I don't think I'm the only one that's like that. I think a lot of us are like that too. So, um, I just think we have to be able to separate the in game trash talk. And from, just who we are as people outside of the yeah, game. Yeah, of know? course. Like once it gets to like the personal stuff, people start almost fighting, then it could get a little too much. But definitely with the in-game trash talk, it's not bad at all. Like remember when uh Simp shot Scum's body and everyone was like freaking out, like, oh my god, he's shooting bodies. Like, I don't know why people get so offended when people shoot bodies. Like I don't even think the players really get so much as offended as some of the supporters do, where it's just like it's not like who cares if someone shoots a body or tea bags. Like literally, it doesn't hurt anyone at all in real life. It doesn't make them feel but like it's not that serious to where you don't have like you can't shoot bodies or anything like no, that. No, let's say say I'm screaming you right now and I gun you down and I shoot your body. And then you know, you're screaming and you say you cool. fucking suck. Like it's yeah. No, no, no. Say it's in a tournament. Say it's in actually yeah, yeah, in a tournament. Yeah. And I gun you and I shoot your body. It's gonna make you be like, fuck Doug, man. Like yeah. You're gonna like lean forward more, and you're gonna start going even harder. You know, exactly. like it's great. It's that's a great good. part that's of the. Like, you know, it makes you. It gets you going. It gets you hyped up. Makes you feel good. And I feel like that's just show more, show more passion and energy, and at least it's just so much more stuff. But I don't know. I feel like with the shooting bodies thing, like people have been like soft about that before, to where it's not that big of a deal. Like at least it's some good rivalries and uh, and fun stuff. But now that we're talking about like the social media and all this kind of crazy stuff, talking that we're talking about. How do you deal with all the hate that you've been getting on social media, whether it's been with like the whole recent thing with the snipers or just in general, where it seems like the guy tweets at you every single tweet of yours where it says, fuck you, Doug. Like it's that, it's that <laughs> video every single time you click on like one of your tweets. Like, how do you deal with that? How do you get by it? And how does it affect you? I or think for me, you? I think for me, it's like, I've never in my life in anything, in any public setting, at any Call of Duty event, any fan meetup I've done, any place I've traveled to, any business adventure I've done, any any event ever that I've ever been to, have I ever seen any of these fucking internet warriors say the shit they say <laughs> to me? Everyone looks at me with a big smile and like, Doug, what's up, Doug? Doug, yo, Doug. And I'm like, what's up, man? Hey, what's up? I give him a hug. Obviously, COVID, I'm like, whoa, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, I just, I, I can only think like, Unless if it's something that I self-inflicted on myself, right? Like if I, um, if I did something where it's like, I can't even think of, I, I honestly can't think, but if there's something that I did to somebody where it's like, I deserve it, it's like, okay, like you, you can hate on me. But I just think people just like to hate on me because they're jealous. Yeah. So the biggest thing for me is like, look, like you can hate on me all you want. You can say whatever you want to say about me. But at the end of the day, there's a plan that I have. It's going to happen. 
Nothing is going to stop it from happening. I don't got to worry about some contractual shit. I don't have to worry about false promises. Yeah. I don't have to worry about somebody telling me one thing and then it's actually a different thing. The only one I have to worry about is my head, myself, what I want to do with my time. And I want to scrim Call of Duty. I want to watch my VOD. I want to destroy people when I play in tournaments. And that's exactly how it's going to go down. And nothing's going to stop that from happening. So look, you continue talking shit if you hate me. If you love me, support me. That's awesome. I definitely love that. And I appreciate it. But um, I, I also think that the more successful you get, the more people just want to criticize you and they want to hate on you and they just yeah. want to drag you back down. So um, look, I, I got a big, big plan in my head of what I want to do and a big goal set. And it's going to happen. So I think there's gonna be a lot more people that are inspired by it and do something good with themselves. And yeah. that's really like the main goal that I want to do with all of this too. Yeah, no, I can't wait to see it unfold. And also I got to ask, cause I see so many people on like the Reddit or just Twitter or sometimes even in the chat, like is Doug delusional or does he actually believe and truly believe what he's saying? Like, what do you, what do you have to say to those people that question if this is real or just you're delusional and you're just saying it just to say it? Well, if it, if it wasn't real, then like, I'd just be uploading like vlogs every single day and like just making money and just like being this like happy YouTuber that yeah. everyone loves, you know, like I did that for years and it's like, it's awesome and I love it, but it's just not where I'm, where I'm want to be, you know? So yeah. like, I think I, I can understand if you like are watching from afar and you just hear me say, I'm going to win champs. And then you'd see me not playing at all for the year. It's like, well, I got lied to you and like, they don't care and they don't even want to hear about it, you know? So it's like, if you see it from afar, I could see where you're coming from. But if you actually like follow my journey and see the shit that I've actually been through, it's like, yo, like I've literally had people tell me it's your team. You could drop these players and then yeah. it doesn't happen. I have owners telling me we want you to be the face of our team. And I literally have lunch with them. And I say, if I'm going to be the face of this team, I'm going to have to play someday. And they go, you're right. I said, I could be patient. I don't have to do it right now, but I need to have a plan of how to get to that point. No plan happens. Then it doesn't happen. You know, it's like, you know, so whatever, man, you know, like yeah. I got nothing, I got nothing holding me back now. And look, if it doesn't happen, then it doesn't happen. But yeah, at least you tried your hardest I, I, and did what you wanted to do. Cause like you, if imagine if it never happened, like you just stayed doing content, which something you doesn't seem like you wanted to do instead of, or like you still want to do it, but you wanted to play COD and compete much more. So one day you'd probably regret that in like an insane amount. So I'm glad to see you doing what you're doing and uh, being successful. And I wish you luck in this Challengers Cup coming up and the, the season and then seeing you back in the league soon. Thanks, Dill. It's, uh, it's going to be a fun one. So make sure you tune into the stream this weekend. Uh, well, well, where, where can I watch? Twitch.tv slash sensor. We're going to have a big okay. tournament. We're practicing every day, going over some search all day tomorrow and Friday. Um, going to be as prepared as we can be. Still very early in the season. I want to put so much weight. Obviously, the tournament's important, but I think a lot of teams don't know the game, obviously, yet. Even the best, like, face still don't know the game. So I think it's very early in the season right now. Um, I think I'm personally a lot really good at a game when it first comes out. You know, I've won majors when the games first come out at the highest level. So I'm pretty confident I'm going to play very well, but... Um, at the end of the day, there's a very long season ahead of us. It's a marathon. There's going to be countless tournaments throughout this year. Yeah. And I just think the, the the players who really want to win and put in that work every day are going to be the ones that show at the end of the season. And look, like look at Shotzi last year, Dill. Like we're all laughing at him saying he sucks because he went like nine and thirty seven in his first land match, and he ended up winning console player of the year, esport player of the year, MVP, champ, champs. champs, champs, MVP of the season, like. Yeah. Those are incredible accomplishments. So it's really just about putting in that the consistent process. Work throughout the season. Like whatever it's happens, process, you got to go with it. Like you're not, you may not start off hot. Like even on New York, we didn't start off hot, but somehow won in a home a home series, and it went well. But um, actually, yeah, I mean, before, dude, at least at least you got to win. I mean, a lot of exactly. teams in the league did it. At least you got to win under your belt, you know. So exactly, you couldn't control that. It went online. You went online. You three would Chicago Huntsman in the finals. You didn't play that well at champs. Shit happens. But dude. You put in a lot of work. I know you guys worked hard every day. I was there. You played really hard every single day, and you got, you're able to get a win. So, you know, yep. it, it's good. It's good. Okay, before I let you go, I got three questions from Twitter. Are, do you think you can handle these? Yeah, hit me. Okay, so this one is from Z Dragon. Doug, do you think lifting screws up your shot post-workout? Why or why not? Definitely not. Um, I think, if anything, it just helps you, like, feel more clear. I like personally, I won one event when I didn't work out. And then I used to like, I worked out and then went into the championship finals and won events three times. So if anything, I think lifting would help you be a better player because it gives you 
uh, more endorphins. It releases some stress. It makes you feel a little bit more clear minded. It makes you feel like a better and more confident person. I feel like it does rub off on your teammates and it could also help them and affect them in a positive way. Yeah. Um, so I definitely think that it helps you. If anything, I don't think that it hurts you. Yeah. I mean, I think when you're around people that are working out, because when you work out in the morning, you feel great the rest of the day. I think everyone who's ever exercised or worked out has experienced that. So it definitely just helps. It helps you think clearly, helps you just get stuff done automatically. Like whenever I work out, I just feel incredible the rest of the day. Um, so I agree with you there. Okay. Another one from No Limit Clarify. What was your favorite memory competing in Call of Duty so far? Winning the national championship in Black Ops 1. Oh, Dude, yeah. I, I, still, I still cry to this day. Just being the dweeby little kid, like <laughs> it was, it was a weird time in my life, man. I, my grades plummeted in high school. I had no scholarships. My, my grandparents died. My family had no money, you know, like I had nothing to my name and being able to do that, like all the work I put into it, man, like being able to make that money, it changed my life, dude. So yeah. definitely that, that, that taught me a lot about myself. Yeah, no, that was a crazy time. Cause that really is life changing money and just a life changing opportunity to, uh, uh, that's just insane. Um, well, we talked about a lot of important stuff throughout this podcast, but honestly, none of it as important as what I'm about to ask you right now. So from Pronaxic, he asked, what's your favorite time of the day to ride the jet ski? Mornings, man. Mornings. Like what time? Like, yeah. what's, the, what's the time in the morning? Like, what, what? I'd say like, I'd say like eight o'clock in the morning. Eight There's o'clock. nothing that beats it. The, the water is so flat. Everything is so beautiful. The sun comes out. You go out, you get a deli sandwich. You go out to the <laughs> ocean. You look at some manta rays swimming under you. It's, it's, I, wish, I wish people could see what my eyeballs see when I do these things. It's, it's so much fun. I, I've got to set my game up. i got to make more content like going out, finding manta rays and sharks out in the ocean, man. Like, have you seen a shark? Yeah. Like we have some sharks out here if we oh. go out to the ocean. Not in the bay. It's very, okay. it's very rare. Like sometimes you see some in the bay, and that's yeah. why I live right on the bay. But if you go out to the ocean, like twenty minutes out, you'll definitely see some sharks if you really look close enough. Um, I don't think they would do anything to you, but yeah. look, if, if I die one day from some freak accident, it's because a shark jumped up and ripped my body apart. I'm, <laughs> like, I'm not even joking. Like this is yeah. literally how I would die in an accident. Like I would die because a shark would rip my body up. So yeah, that's how it would be. Hopefully, it don't you happen. Know? But at least you're doing something you and love it, on the jet ski. Dude, if it happens, then listen, it was worth it. I'm telling you, man, it was worth it. Like, I would not trade this for the world, dude. Yeah. And how many jet skis do you have now? I think I see I had jet two, ski tweet every kind of I, like, where you're trading them in, different color, you know, different design. Yeah, I got two over the summer because of quarantine and yeah. bored. And then I just decided to just get rid of them both and get the new one. So I, I just got one and that's it. I got one. I got the pool done. I got the hot tub. I got the grill. I got the yeah. fireplace. I'm done. Like, my house is done. I'm happy. I don't got to do more renovations. I'm just going to pay this mortgage off. I'm gonna make it back in the COD League. I'm gonna win champs with you, Dylan, or playing you in the finals. Either yep. way, just know if you're in champs finals, Dylan. <laughs> you had your ring, Dylan. You had your ring already. It's my turn. Yeah. It's my turn now, man. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> you're like, yeah, I no, you're like, yeah, I gotta, no. I gotta get that second. I gotta one, get dude. another one, bro. The way I look at it, one ring is so close to no ring. So if you only That's got what I one, like, Dylan. On a serious note, though, like there's certain players that I see. Like, look at your play versus optic, the one v three. I mean. There's only a few players that have that type of ice, bro. So yeah, you you're a tough the, player. You're a tough player to beat, especially in a championship match. You're a very tough player. You elevate your game. So I it's appreciate be tough. that. But you know, gotta put that work in and see what we can do with the rest of the season. Uh, Doug, it's been an honor. It's been fun. This is definitely one of the most interesting episodes we've had. So many good talks, and I, I'm honestly I'm fucking hyped right now. I'm about to go to the grocery store and get some food, and then probably try and uh, rank up some guns in Nuketown. Um, but yeah, it's been an honor. Uh, thank you for coming on the show. Hope you had a good time. I, I appreciate it, man. I'm about to go get some diamond snipers now. So hey, I'm going to go, get, get I'm gonna go do Yo, that. Send me, uh, I'll send you an invite when I get back, okay? After I get some food. I'll be on for like two hours if you want to play. All right, bet. We'll run it up. Get some snipers, some camos easily. All right, let's do it, dude. I'll see All you right, later, man. Peace out, brother. Have a good night. Good luck in the tournament this weekend. Oh, yeah. Your house looks beautiful, by the way. The new pool, it looks, like, it looks perfect. I can't wait to use it next season. I haven't been able to use it yet. Really? It's going to be fun. Oh yeah, I used true. it two times because I got it in like October. It yeah, was too yeah, cold. Yeah. Okay, that's dope. All right, stream. Thank you guys for watching. Hope you guys enjoyed this one. Um, Doug is that guy. I hope you're all motivated. Go lift. Go get camos. Go do whatever you got to do. Whatever your craft is, go perfect it. Make that progress. Uh, thank you guys for uh, tuning into another episode. Hope you all enjoyed. I will see you next time. And as always, my name is Dylan Attach Price. This is Doug Sensor Martin. 
I'm not as buff as him, but I'm, I can get there one day with enough, uh, you know, enough motivation and determination. I'm maybe, so we'll see. But have a good night, everyone. Peace out. See you, man.